Welcome to part one of the Afro Vegan Society speaker series featuring Dr. Priyumvira Naik, the Veg Doc, speaking on COVID-19 and the risk to black and brown communities. This education session is made possible thanks to our sponsors, Better Food Foundation, A Well-Fed World, and Veg Fund. Afro Vegan Society is helping disempowered communities take back control of their health and environments through vegan living. Support our work and visit afroveganSociety.org slash get involved to donate. Hey, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to this important talk. We have Dr. Priyambada Naik, um, also known as the Veg Doc, and she is going to be talking about COVID-19 and the dangers to black and brown communities, which is a huge topic um, that's all in the news right now. And so it's such an honor to have someone who is so knowledgeable on this topic take the time to come out and speak with us um, about this. So I just wanted to go through um, the Veg Docs bio, which is extensive, you know, so like basically the first 20 minutes is going to be the bio. No, just kidding. But this is, <laughs> this. I mean, you know, like, the bio will speak for itself. Dr. Nike is a triple board certified physician in pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, and lifestyle medicine. She has additional training and expertise in lung transplantation, ECMO, interstitial lung disease, genetic lung disease, immunology, and nutrition. She attended Duke University followed by medical school at the Medical College of Georgia. She did her internal medicine residency and pulmonary and critical care fellowships at Emory University, the last two years of which she was the lung transplant fellow. She has been vegan for nine plus years and has been studying nutrition and lifestyle changes as it relates to chronic disease ever since. Going vegan inspired her to change her career trajectory, and she uses her expertise to help people control and even reverse chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, rheumato rheumatologic conditions, inflammatory bowel diseases, and more. One of the most rewarding things for Dr. Knight is seeing a patient with multiple chronic diseases who empowers themselves with her guidance to change their health and their quality of life. Her work in lifestyle medicine often produces just as dramatic results as her work in the fields of critical care and transplantation. She also enjoys public speaking to help people understand the power of plant foods and works with physicians to teach them how to prescribe plants over pills. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Knight, for being here and for speaking on this important topic. Thank you so much for having me, Brenda. Um, I just want to say I'm really honored that you asked me. Your organizations, I should say organizations, because you're involved in so many uh, wonderful, amazing groups. Um, you know, you're just doing such phenomenal work. And having spent most of my career in the South and training at a large um, community hospital and, and a large county hospital, I obviously see um, the racial disparities front and center. The, the main hospital I trained at, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, some of my patients called it the Grady's because they remember when it was a black Grady and a white Grady and there was a black wing and a white wing. So, you know, this is certainly something that we are still dealing with to this day, um, you know, that started 400 years ago with slavery, unfortunately. And so um, this is such a great topic. I really appreciate your getting me involved. All right, so I'm going to get out of here <laughs> and turn it over to you. As uh, Brenda already said, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Dr. Priyamba the Nike, and I'm board certified in pulmonary critical care and lifestyle medicine. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I tend to be more on Instagram at underscore the veg doc if you're interested. Uh, though I am vegan, I tend to focus on my social media accounts on the medical aspects of uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet, just as an FYI. Um, and the talk that I'm giving today is called COVID-19 and the risk to black and brown communities. So I've split this talk up into two different portions because each section in and of itself is so large that I could talk for an hour or two on each of these topics. So part one is going to be, what is COVID-19? 
I want to address a lot of the myths and incomplete truths that we're seeing re re uh, related to COVID-19. And then I want to talk about two different presentations that we're seeing in the most severely ill people. One of those is ARDS, and this is a very feared complication because there's a high mortality rate to it. But if you do survive ARDS, there's a lot of morbidity associated with it, meaning that there are long-term complications that people can have. But there's also an atypical presentation that we've started seeing in the last few months that I'm going to address as well. And then part two, uh, hang on, there we go. Uh, part two is going to be sort of the, the bulk of the talk, and it's gonna look at things like racial and ethnic disparities in infection and illness rates, particularly with COVID-19, but I'm actually gonna backtrack a little bit uh, and talk about other, um, other epidemics that we've seen and how we've seen racial disparities play out there. I'll sum up everything at the end of that. And then, you know, I, I mean, I won't wanna warn viewers, I think most of the people who are watching this are probably already aware that there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, in economics, in representation in America. So unfortunately, a lot of the data that I'm talking about is incredibly depressing. But I do want to end with a, you know, more of a positive note of things that we can do ourselves personally to sort of help with that, and then things that we can do within the system that I think can help to change some of that. So let's start with what COVID-19 is. This is an electron microscope image of coronavirus. So coronavirus is actually a very general term. It's actually a family of viruses, uh, which are RNA viruses. So it's an RNA strand surrounded by a protein coat. And that's what you see here. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Nope, you can't see my arrow. But the round thing that you're seeing, that's the actual protein coat. You can't actually see the genetic material. And then the spikes on top is where the name Corona comes from, because it looks a little bit like a crown, you know, that people wore back in the day. So there are four different types specifically within the coronavirus family that can affect humans. Those are called the HCOVs, and they're the alpha and beta um, genera. So coronaviruses are responsible from everything uh, as mild as the common cold to SARS, which occurred a few years ago in Eastern Asia, to MERS, which occurred in the Middle East. They are universally viruses that come from animals. In other words, they're zoonotic or what we call spillover viruses. So what this means is that the virus initially starts in an animal host, but over time it mutates and it typically is mutating because of two things. One, we are cramming animals together in very crowded situations. That causes their stress level to go up. We know that high stress results in a low immune system, making it much easier for the virus to mutate because the host's immune system is not able to survey the body properly and destroy the virus when it finds it. But over time, the other portion of that that's a key component is our exposure to the animals. So for example, if you look at things like Ebola, HIV, uh, mad cow disease, all of these occurred because we have a tendency to confine animals in horrific conditions. And if we're not confining them, we're invading their territories. And so now all of a sudden we're exposed to viruses that we would not have been before. The viruses mutate and they jump hosts. That's what we mean by spillover. So let's talk a little bit about some of the myths and incomplete truths. Okay. And there's quite a few. You're going to see me, uh, uh, look down at my paper because I've got some data that I that I didn't want to put in the slides, but I had not memorized. So you're going to see me look down in just a second. So the most common thing that I hear is it's like the flu. And there are multiple reasons why this disease is not at all like the flu. First and foremost, we have a vaccine for the flu. So what I mean by that is we have a, a vaccination that while it doesn't guarantee you won't get the flu, it does decrease the likelihood that you're going to get the flu. And if you do get the flu, it generally protects you from a more severe course. It generally allows you to have a milder course and a shorter course of the flu. We also have known antivirals that work really well for that. And we have more than one antiviral. In fact, there are four or five antivirals that we can use for the flu. The one that we commonly think of is Tamiflu or Estelmavir, but there are other options out there if you happen to be resistant to Tamiflu. So that's another way that it's different. 
Another way that the flu is different is our flu season is much longer. So typically our flu season in America starts around late September, early October, and it goes through sometimes to March or April, depending from season to season. But what that means is, is that we see a slow, steady trickle of patients over that course, where if you get sick enough because you didn't get the flu shot or you happen to have gotten the flu shot, but it didn't work that season, and you end up in a hospital, we're seeing a slow, steady trickle into the hospital. So we're not overwhelming the hospital system. Now, that's not to say that the hospital system doesn't get overwhelmed. Every year, there's at least a week in December and a week in January where our ICUs are full, hospitals go on diversion because they can't take any more patients. But what we're seeing with COVID-19 is we're seeing a huge influx of patients very quickly, and it's overwhelming hospitals. So we have hospitals, for example, at capacity in many states and over capacity. As we know in New York City, not only were hospitals at capacity, they were starting to create makeshift hospitals, and they were starting to open these tent-like structures to take care of hospitalized patients because so many patients arrived all at the same time. When that happens, a couple things occur. Outcomes are affected by the number of patients that each doctor is seeing. We know this from other data. So if you are a doctor who's supposed to only see 13 to 15 patients for best outcomes, and all of a sudden you're seeing 20, that's gonna affect your ability to take care of all of them well. If you have four respiratory therapists, but now you have 40 patients on a vent, that's a lot of work for those respiratory therapists. So that's another way that this is different than the flu. Another way that this is different than the flu is typically when I see a patient who has the flu and they're in the hospital, they don't all end up in the ICU. We're seeing a greater proportion of patients with COVID end up in the ICU because they're getting much sicker, much quicker. But then what ends up happening when they do get sick and they do end up requiring something like a ventilator, which is when we put a tube in the throat and we connect you to a machine and we do the work of breathing for you because your lungs aren't working properly and it's exhausting to the patient. The problem is typically when someone has the flu, a patient might be on the ventilator for about a week. It's pretty unusual to be on the ventilator longer than seven to 10 days when you have a bad flu. The average length of stay on the ventilator alone for COVID-19 is 22 days. So nearly a month on the ventilator. And now you've got an entire ICU full of patients with COVID-19. So this is yet another way that this is unlike the flu. And as we go through this talk, I'll point out some other ways that this isn't like the flu. So a lot of people are saying more people die from heart disease and stroke in a year. This isn't really that big a deal. And while technically that is true, again, context is key. So yes, while it is true that the number one killers globally are heart disease and stroke, right now our number one killers are COVID. And again, it's the volume that we're seeing and the time frame that we're seeing it. Another thing to point out is if someone comes in in cardiac arrest, typically they're in and out of the hospital within a week, maybe two, after you've fixed their heart, after you've stented them, or after they've had bypass surgery. Again, the average length of stay is not 22 days for these these particular disease processes. So a lot of people are blaming the Chinese and Chinese wet markets. And while technically it is true that we do believe that this did originate in an animal in a Chinese wet market, we're not really sure what it is. Some people think it might be bats. Some people think it might be pangolins. Um, we're not really sure. The, the fact of the matter is this occurs because of our use of animals. As I said before, all coronaviruses are spillover viruses. So this is more a function of the fact that we use animals. As an example, the last um, large outbreak that we had that caused a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality was swine flu. And the reason it was called swine flu is it originated on a pig farm in North Carolina. And it killed people in North Carolina and Mexico, and then it spread globally. So this is not an unusual thing. Every major outbreak that we see is related to our use of animals. So a lot of people like to say this is a disease of the old. And so this is where you're going to see me look down because I'm going to look at some statistics. So if you look at the CDC's morbidity and mortality report, uh, the, more, the most recent sort of one with general data uh, was from uh, mid-March. And it showed that that is not at all the case. And I'm going to give you some more recent data as well. So the morbidity mortality report from mid-March, these are the statistics. So of the people that were hospitalized, 20% of them were between the ages of 20 to 44. 
and 18% were between the ages of 45 and 54. 17% were between the ages of 55 and 64. So nearly 60% of patients are below the age of 65. So this is not at all a disease of the elderly. Now it is true that the people who are disproportionately dying do tend to be the folks that are above 65 and particularly the group above 70 and 80. Those folks are the ones that have the highest mortality. But as we go through this talk, I hope I can convince you that mortality is not the only thing that we need to be worried about when we talk about COVID-19. I'm gonna give you a little bit more recent data um, from uh, the CDC. So the CDC looked at data in Georgia, which is where I am in May, and they looked at 305 hospitalized patients, and they found that 62% of patients were less than 65. So the same data that we were seeing in March, we're still seeing now. 51% of patients were female, 83% of patients were black that were in the hospital. 26% of patients they could not find an underlying condition for. Now, I, I think that we need to mention one caveat to that. It's not clear to me when they were looking at underlying conditions because I can't find the original data um, tables if they were looking at obesity as a risk factor as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might affect data in, um, in the future. But you know, we're seeing this in a lot of different places and we're seeing again, young people with this disease. And as I said, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about why it's not just about death. That, that's not the only thing that we worry about when we worry about COVID. So the next two topics, actually the next three, I'm gonna sort of address all at the same time. So I see a lot of people wearing N95 masks out in public. And I, and I see a lot of arguments about should we be wearing masks and should we not be wearing masks? And then I'm also seeing, well, every day the story changes. Initially we were told we don't need to wear masks and now we're being told we do. So I wanna talk about all three together. So first and foremost, it's important to understand that N95s protect you from other people. But there's a big caveat. There's a big sort of warning about N95s. And that is that N95s need to be fitted to your face. So every year in the hospital, because I work with patients who can have tuberculosis and I do high risk procedures that can uh, risk infecting me and others in the room when I'm doing the procedure, I have to do something called a fit test. And it's when they put this big mask on my, on my head, it's almost like a hazmat helmet. And then they make me wear different sizes of N95s and they aerosolize um, really gross tasting things like saccharin and things like that. And then if I can taste them, that means that there's a leak in the mask and that means that mask does not fit me. So the problem that I'm seeing is that I routinely go to the grocery store and I see people wearing these N95s and they think it's giving them some level of protection and it's really not because it's loose. They're only wearing one strap, so it's flapping when they're talking. The other issue with N95s is nobody really knows how to take them on and off, so they're often grabbing them here. Well, if someone has coughed and you think that the mask has protected you and now you've got droplets sitting on top of the mask, you've just touched the mask, now it's on your hands, and then what's the first thing people like to do when they take a mask off? They touch their face because they're sweaty or they're itchy or something like that. So N95s, if you have them, please donate them to your local hospitals because the people who really need them, the people who are at the greatest risk of exposure are our healthcare workers. And if we lose more doctors and nurses and residents and healthcare workers, and not just those folks, but also the people in environmental services, the medical assistants, if those people are out of the system and they can't take care of people because they're sick or God forbid they've died, then everyone is in trouble. Well, what about regular masks? What about the surgical masks? Why are we telling people that they should be wearing them now? Initially, we were telling people we didn't need to wear them. And the reason for that is very simple. The ideal thing to do during an outbreak is to lock down, is for everyone to go into immediate strict quarantine so that we're not spreading the germs. The problem is when we first started making recommendations, it was our hope in the scientific community that people would follow that. Unfortunately, people didn't follow that. And there were there are a variety of reasons for that not being followed. Some of that is people just didn't have the option. If you're a grocery store worker, if you're a transit worker, you don't have that option. But we had never said, you know, shut down grocery stores or shut down essential services. The problem is, is that we were seeing so many people saying that, you know, their businesses were essential when, I mean, they just really aren't essential to day-to-day -day life. And we were seeing people still wanting to go out for picnics and wanting to go out and sit down in restaurants. And we weren't 
we weren't slowing the spread of the disease quickly enough to prevent overwhelming the hospital system. That's called flattening the curve because we weren't able to do that in a timely manner because we just couldn't get people to sort of follow those rules. It's, this is literally a situation where the CDC and other organizations have thrown up their hands and said, fine, since no one's really listening to us, everyone needs to wear a mask because that way we are protecting others from us. When you wear a surgical mask, the vast majority of what you're doing is protecting other people from you. So when you cough, that's a physical barrier. Now, what's really important to know is the mask is not nearly as effective if you're wearing it here, okay? It needs to cover your nose and your mouth. And I routinely see people wearing it only on their mouth. I see people pulling it down to talk. Well, you've just defeated the purpose wearing the mask to protect others. But again, the reason that things were changing when it came to the mask was because this is simply a situation where people weren't doing what we really needed them to do. And so this is the next best thing. There's some other things that have changed um, in the story, if that's what you want to call it, um, with COVID-19. So for example, initially we were treating everybody like they had this disease process called ARDS, and now we're seeing that we need to start treating people differently. We were trying all these different drugs. This isn't because medicine is the wild, wild west. It's because whenever there's a pandemic, we're first relying on data from other countries. So for example, because there was a delay in COVID-19 arriving at the, in the U.S., we were relying on data coming from China and then Italy. Well, those are slightly different healthcare systems and they have slightly different patient populations and comorbidities and things like that. There's also a potential question of was China suppressing data? So we were relying on other information. And then once the pandemic hit our shores, it takes a little bit of time to start collecting data. So what you're actually seeing is science working in real time. This isn't a conspiracy or people changing their minds. This is literally science working in real time. And as we collect data, we modify our recommendations based on that. So a lot of people think this was created in the lab. I don't want to spend too much time on this. You can Google nature.com, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, and it is the research paper that clearly shows why this was very clearly not created in the lab. This is clearly a natural virus, uh, and, the mil and military intelligence has confirmed this. There's a vaccine ready to go. So that's not completely true. We do have trials that have shown that the vaccine is safe. The interesting thing about this particular vaccine is for the first time in a long time, we've bypassed um, animal testing, which as a vegan, I, I find that very helpful. And, I, and I, we know that animal testing is not super reliable when it comes to things like drugs and that kind of thing. But, um, but we've, we've done some of the safety trials. We have some ongoing efficacy trials, meaning making sure that the, that the vaccine isn't just safe for humans, but that it actually works. There are one or two trials out there that currently have shown some uh, efficacy, but these are very small trials. So until we do large scale trials, we can't definitively say that there is a vaccine ready for prime time. There are a few great treatment options. So they're not great treatment options. We have some experimental options that are available to us, but they're not great treatment options. Okay, uh, hang on one second. Kobe. I'm so sorry, my dog is sniffing one of my plants. And I just wanna make sure he doesn't eat anything. Okay, sorry about that. So there are some experimental treatment options that are um, available and they seem to be promising, but I would still consider them experimental because we don't have enough data and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So I'm gonna talk about the next two very briefly. There was a period of time where we were thinking we needed to stop NSAIDs like aspirin, ibuprofen, things like that. There was also a period of time where we were wondering if we needed to stop medications called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, also known as ARBs. The reason we thought that was initially when we noticed that people who were dying from COVID tended to be people with heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, we were wondering if it was actually because of the medicine. And that's because of the mechanism by which uh, COVID uh, infects us, by which this coronavirus infects us. So if you remember from that picture initially in my slides, um, there's a crown, right? And there's a round part, and then there's these spikes, right? The spikes are called the S protein. That S protein binds to a receptor on our cells called the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2, meaning the ACE2 receptor. 
Well, when you take NSAIDs, when you take ACE inhibitors, when you take ARBs, there's actually a slight upregulation of the ACE2 receptor. So everyone was wondering, well, is the reason that people are doing poorly because we have them on these medicines that they need for these diseases, but it's actually making it easier for the virus to enter? There was never any good evidence of this. Nobody ever really recommended this. The, the exception to that is for a brief period of time, the WHO recommended that people stop NSAIDs. In the US, we never really felt that the data was robust for that. It was really based on very small data coming out of Europe. Um, and in fact, shortly thereafter, the WHO actually rescinded that recommendation. We now have data that actually suggests that if you're on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, it actually might be protective. So we're actually seeing lower mortality in those folks. And whether that's because the ARB is actually blocking the receptor so that the virus can't um, infect the cell, or whether that's just because we have better control of our comorbidities when we're on these drugs, it's not clear. If you are on these medicines, under no circumstances should you stop them. As I said, we're finding that they're protective, but more importantly, these drugs are hugely important. So for example, if you're on an ACE inhibitor, we know that if you have type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, ACE inhibitors protect your kidneys for longer from kidney damage, which is one of the most feared complications of type 2 diabetes. If you have heart failure, ACE inhibitors can actually remodel the heart and help to improve pump function. The same thing with ARB. So these are critical drugs. Nobody should ever stop a medication without talking to their physician first. Okay. So I'm also seeing things like, well, but you know, since most people are fine and they survive it, 90, there's 99% survival, we should all try to get COVID because we'll be immune. Well, there's two major reasons why that's not a great plan. The first one is, I hope I've convinced you now that the vast majority of people who are being hospitalized are actually young people. And we're now even seeing a Kawasaki-like uh, massive inflammatory disease in very young people, children, which we weren't seeing initially. So I hope I can convince you that getting COVID is not a guarantee that you're gonna be one of those people that has mild disease. The other thing is we have no proof at this time that getting COVID and getting antibodies to COVID means that you are immune, means that you cannot get COVID again. We just don't know. The reason we don't know is there has not been enough time. In fact, scientists believe that there's going to be a second wave, whether that's gonna be reinfections or people that were locked down adequately initially and were loosening lockdown restrictions too soon is not clear. But what we do know is that there is no guarantee that you are immune if you have COVID-19 or if you've had it in the past, even if you have antibodies. We don't know how much immunity that confirms, uh, confers, if any. So how is it transmitted? It's transmitted person to person that's through droplets. So the reason we differentiate in medicine between droplets and airborne is because of how, the, how those particular particulates are um, transmitted. So when someone has, when something is droplet transmissible, what that means is you cough, you sneeze, you talk. So uh, dr droplets of saliva or mucus kind of come out of your mouth or nose and there's virus particles in there. But the droplets are quite heavy, so they don't travel typically more than about six feet. That's why everybody keeps saying stay more than six feet away because that way if someone is talking to you or coughing and they're not wearing a mask, it's less likely to infect you. There are no guarantees at six feet. We've seen, we've seen it transmit further than that, particularly if you're, for example, running and you're breathing more heavily because you're exercising, things like that. But six feet is generally what we're looking at. Airborne is slightly different. Airborne is smaller particulates, and, and sometimes we'll see that uh, stay in the air longer. So there was a lab study that was, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year that said that they were able to find COVID-19 for up to three hours in the air. I don't want anybody to panic. That was a lab situation. That was a controlled false situation. That's not what we're seeing in the real world. So we have no evidence that if you go to the grocery store and someone sneezed an hour before that there are droplets in the air. That said, you should be wearing a mask anyway because hopefully you're protecting other people and that should confer a slight bit of protection to you as well. We've also seen it found in ventilation systems. But again, we don't know how much of that is translating to infection. We do know with droplets that is translating to infection. We've also found um, COVID-19 in uh, semen. We can find it in feces. We can find it in blood. So we don't know if those are other routes that it can be transmitted at this time. 
viral shedding is an issue. So anytime anyone uh, develops a viral illness, there's the risk of viral shedding, uh, like in the feces and things like that. So the longest documented time for viral RNA shedding was 42 days. However, again, we don't know if that means that that person is still infectious. They likely were not still infectious. They likely had cleared the um, virus within themselves. They, they had been treated, you know, they had developed antibodies, they had um, beaten the active symptoms, but they were still shedding virus. Sometimes we shed virus and we're not infectious still, sometimes we are. We just don't know quite yet because we haven't had enough time to study it. So let's talk a little bit about treatment options. Now I'm going to show you a series of images as I go through this. This first image is a CT scan of a normal lung and it's just one representative picture. Okay. So the way, the way to look at it is, so you've got this, the whole um, sort of uh, elliptical body. That's the, that's the entire torso. In the center, you'll see that round white thing that's got sort of these other uh, darker white in the center. That's actually the heart. And then you see these two things coming off it. Those are the um, pulmonary arteries. So the black that you're seeing is the lung. And then the white strands within that are the airways and the blood vessels. But this is what a normal lung looks like. So 80% of people are going to have mild disease if they contract COVID-19. That means they're, they're either not going to have symptoms at all, or they're going to have minimal symptoms, meaning they might have a low-grade temperature, they might have a cough, they may have a pneumonia, but they're not significantly in distress, okay? The treatment for this is what we call supportive care. It means staying at home, doing the same kinds of things you would do if you had a cold or if you had the flu. So making sure you hydrate, making sure that you take it easy if you are someone who exercises on a regular basis or, you know, uh, coming, you know, staying away from work, assuming that that's a possibility as we get to part two, we'll talk about how that unfortunately isn't a possibility for many Americans. Don't go to your PCP, contact your PCP via phone or um, through the electronic medical record system because they may send you for testing as testing is becoming more widespread finally, um, but they may just wanna monitor you at home. The reason we don't want you coming in is because you're still infectious and we don't want you spreading it to other otherwise healthy people who are there to see their PCP for something else. Some interesting stuff out of China showed that for whatever reason in China, when someone tested positive, whether they had symptoms or not, they scanned their chest, they did CT scans of their chest and they actually found even without any symptoms, that there was some lung involvement. That does not mean that if you test positive but you have no symptoms that you need a CT scan. That doesn't really accomplish anything other than exposing the radiation department to, an, to someone who's got COVID-19, whether they have symptoms or not. Um, and it just exposes you to radiation unnecessarily. The reason they were doing it was for research purposes. I just think it's interesting that you may have no symptoms but have some mild involvement. But it goes to show why just because you feel fine, that's not an adequate dis, uh, judgment that you are not potentially uh, uh, able to spread the infection to other people. Now, that's 80% of people, but 15% of people have severe disease. And this is another way that the flu is slightly different because we typically don't see this kind of, of severity in the flu. So this is, these are two CT images of a patient with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 uh, from China. And so I'm hoping that you can tell from the previous picture, now all of a sudden those black areas have more white in them. So now the air sacs are filling with fluid. So you're gonna have more symptoms if you have severe disease. You're gonna have dyspnea, which is a fancy term for shortness of breath. You're gonna have higher fevers. You're gonna to continue to cough. You're gonna have hypoxia, which is when your oxygen levels are abnormally low. And you're gonna have more extensive infiltrates or um, this sort of white spread on the CT scan. Now, typically what we were initially thinking that we were gonna see, and this is what was reported out of Italy, this is what was reported out of Spain, out of China, was a disease called ARDS. And I'm gonna go over that in some detail because I want you to understand it. But now we're starting to see an atypical presentation as well. So we're seeing two different types of people. We're seeing people that come in and they have standard ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then we're seeing people that don't have all of those characteristics, but they're still very hypoxic. They still have very low oxygen levels. So if you are one of these people, you absolutely need to seek medical attention. Again, do not go to your primary care doctor. Go to an ER. 
You're going to be treated with things like oxygen, depending on how severe your um, disease is. You may be started on experimental therapies. You may require blood thinners if you have the, the atypical presentation. Um, they may send you home, depending on where you live. If, if your only symptom is hypoxia, but in every other way you're doing okay, your fevers are manageable, you don't really have um, significant findings on CT scan, they may say, look, let's send you home, we're gonna put you on oxygen, we're gonna monitor you. But again, that's dependent on your area. So for example, if you're not in an area that can set up emergency oxygen very quickly, or the hospital system itself doesn't have an adequate way of monitoring you at home safely, then you will be admitted. Um, but there are some places where um, people are being sent home in quarantine on oxygen. So here's another way that this disease is unlike the flu. So remember I said that typically when someone has the flu and they get infected, they're on a ventilator, but they're not on a ventilator for nearly as long as we're seeing with COVID. We're also not seeing the same proportion of patients, the same percentage of patients get severe disease. We're seeing more patients with severe disease with COVID than we typically see with the flu. So people who become critically ill, that's about 5% of patients, and they develop full on respiratory failure. So I'm, I'm hoping that you can see, this is a patient who transitioned from very minimal disease on day five. There are some abnormalities to that CT scan, but then uh, by day 15, that's um, picture B, you're starting to see much more damage in the bases of the lungs, that's the bottom part of the image. And then in, by day 20, much more of the lung is involved. So these folks need much higher oxygen delivery mechanisms. So typically when you see someone on oxygen, you know, you see the, the cannula and then you see the oxygen tank, right? Well, that, there's only a certain amount of oxygen that can be delivered in that system. So if someone requires more oxygen than that, then we have to do things like high flow oxygen. We might do um, a form of positive pressure ventilation called BiPAP. That's when you wear a mask on your face and it blows air into your system. It's similar, but um, but has more, uh, it's more involved than something called CPAP, which you may know of if you or someone you know has sleep apnea, we use a similar mask for that, but, but it's a slightly different physiology. So BiPAP and high flow systems work well, but they are very dangerous to staff because when you are wearing high flow oxygen or when you are wearing BiPAP, you are actively aerosolizing the virus at much higher rates because now you've got oxygen being delivered with some degree of force and high flow, uh, and it makes it much easier for people in the room to be infected. It doesn't change your ability to get worse or better. It has nothing to do with that, but it, it's much riskier for everyone else in the room. If that doesn't work, then we might need to move towards something called mechanical ventilation. That's when Instead of doing the BiPAP mask where we're pushing air into your lungs, if that's not working for you. Maybe your muscles are tiring. Maybe it's not, you're not getting enough oxygen that way. Maybe your carbon dioxide levels are going up because your lungs do two things. When you breathe in, you take in oxygen. And when you breathe out, you get rid of carbon dioxide. So if you're not able to do those things efficiently, we may need to put you on a ventilator. Some people call that life support. That's when we put a tube down the throat and we connect you to a machine. If that is not enough for you, we might need to go to something called ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So we do this sometimes in little babies and it works really well in babies, but the mortality in adults is very different than it is in babies. ECMO is essentially like doing bypass, but outside of the OR. So what we're basically doing is we're doing the work of your lungs and possibly your heart by pulling blood out of your system, oxygenating it on a filter, and then pumping it back into your system. Depending on the type of ECMO we may be doing on you, it may in fact also be that we're doing the work of your heart. If you are sick enough to require ECMO, if we are considering ECMO on you, your mortality is already between 70 and 90%. So ECMO is not something that we're doing for everybody because A, a lot of people don't qualify for ECMO because the mortality is so high for it. The other thing that, to know about ECMO is very few centers do ECMO. That is growing. Really, ECMO started taking off after the 2008-2009 swine flu epidemic. Um, because it was used as salvage therapy there as well. But again, every center that does it, with a few exceptions, they may only have one, two, three beds um, for people who do ECMO. It's very resource intensive. 
Um, it requires a lot of care. There are a lot of complication rates that occur with this. Um, bleeding is a very common complication. The first patient I ever put on ECMO uh, in my first job out of training, we cleared out the state of blood products because the patient bled so much. So this is not something that we just sort of take on lightly for patients. Now, if you do end up on a ventilator, this is a very scary thing. And the reason it's scary is if you develop typical ARDS, one of the treatments for that is proning you. That means we take you from being on your back to flipping you onto your stomach. I've crashed people on ECMO. That's not nearly as scary as proning a patient. When you prone a patient, you are at risk of the tube dislodging, the big IV that they have in their neck dislodging. People usually have a catheter in their radial artery um, to monitor blood pressure. If any of these things dislodge, it can mean very sudden death for the patient, right? Because these are literally life support systems. And if you lose one of them flipping a patient, that's dangerous. So that's a very nerve wracking thing, but we know that it works if you have typical ARDS. Another treatment is inhaled nitric oxide. Um, I want you to remember that because I'm going to talk a little bit about that in part two of the talk when I talk about um, how we can help ourselves and protect ourselves. But inhaled nitric oxide has been shown to improve oxygenation for patients. But the other thing that we're starting to see with COVID specifically is COVID may not be able to replicate well in an in a, a, um, environment where there's a lot of nitric oxide. So when people inhale nitric oxide, um, we may actually see benefits. There's some studies ongoing right now in the Boston area where they're actually having um, healthcare workers inhale nitric oxide before and after shift, and they're randomizing people to see if the folks who got the inhaled nitric oxide actually have less of a chance of getting infected. This is not the same as nitrous. So this is not like people shouldn't show up to their dentists wanting to inhale laughing gas. This is a totally different thing. So other treatments are gonna be the experimental treatments. So convalescent plasma, meaning the antibodies from somebody who has already had the disease and cleared the disease, and they've now produced antibodies. We're starting to see very promising results with that. The initial data from the remdesivir trials um, seems to be very promising as well. Remdesivir is an antiviral medication that was originally designed for Ebola. It unfortunately didn't really work very well with Ebola, but it seems to show promise here. Anti-IL-6 therapies seem to be promising. So IL-6, interleukin-6 is an inflammatory cytokine. It's highly upregulated in many disease processes, but particularly we're seeing that in COVID as well. There are anti-IL-6 drugs on the market currently for a variety of rheumatologic diseases because again, it's an inflammatory marker. So we're trying that in these patients and we are starting to see promise. If you are one of the people that has sort of this atypical uh, phenotype where, um, and I shouldn't say atypical, it's actually more common than we initially thought. But if you're one of the people that has the phenotype where you're actually developing blood clots, blood thinners may be added to your medications. So I'm not gonna go over these slides in great detail, but I wanted people to have access to them. So I'm gonna kind of go through them. You can pause the video at this point and read through these. but. What I want to talk about very briefly is ARDS. So that's what we're starting to see. When people develop a pneumonia or pancreatitis or they get into a car accident, things like that, they're at risk for something called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. This was first described in World War I. And what people were finding, what medics were finding is that people would have non-thoracic injuries. So they might get shot in the leg. They might develop severe pancreatitis. They might have needed massive amounts of blood products from trauma, from being shot in war. And they do fine and they'd be recovering from their disease, but within a few hours to a few days, they would suddenly develop severe respiratory distress, even though they'd never had any lung trauma, they'd not inhaled anything that would explain it. This was eventually coined um, as adult respiratory distress syndrome in the 60s. We've since realized that it can occur in kids as well, which is why we call it acute respiratory distress syndrome. Basically, what it is, is it's an acute onset of lung injury. The hallmark of it is you're going to have bilateral, meaning on both sides of the lung, you're going to see um, abnormalities in, on imaging, whether that's chest x-ray or CT scan. So what you're going to see is something called pulmonary edema, which is when the lung air sacs fill with fluid. And I'm going to show you an image of that in a minute. But the key here is that this pulmonary edema is not related to heart failure. So heart failure is a very common cause of fluid building up in the lungs. When the heart doesn't pump properly, fluid backs up and it ends up spilling into the lungs. 
That's not what ARDS is. ARDS is inflammation. And one of the other hallmarks is um, this thing called a PAO2 to FIO2 ratio. You don't need to worry about that, what that is, other than to know that what that means is we're not able to oxygenate properly when we have ARDS. So this is um, uh, an image from uh, sort of a descriptive image of what is happening in ARDS. So what you're seeing here is an air sac, which is called an alveolus. And then underneath that, that long thing running underneath it is a capillary. So the part where the half where the arrow is pointing to is what normal should look like. So your air sac should really not have anything in it. There's a little bit of a surfactant layer, which we all need to get oxygen to diffuse through our system into the blood vessels. But what we're actually seeing with ARDS is something called an exudative phase. That's how it starts, this lung injury. Where there's injury, then there's a massive inflammatory response, and you get this spilling of inflama inflammatory fluids, um, inflammatory molecules, proteinaceous fluid that just ends up in your in your air sac. So it's almost like you're drowning, but you're drowning in inflammatory fluid. The problem is, is that if it continues to progress, it results in something called the fibrotic phase. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this. You can pause this and read through the bullets if you'd like, but I want you to focus on what I've written here in red, which is what ends up happening in the fibrotic phase is you get lung scarring, which is not reversible generally. You can get cysts or holes in the lung. The lungs become very stiff. So instead of being nice and flexible, where you take in a deep breath and your lungs open up and then they collapse and go down, they become very stiff. The analogy that I like to use is if you blow up a balloon, it's still fairly pliable, right? But now I want you to take duct tape and wrap it around that balloon and then try to blow air into it. You're not gonna be able to do that, right? So that's what happens because the, the um, lung itself becomes very stiff from damage and from scarring. Folks who survive ARDS often require um, long-term oxygen. So these are images of a patient with uh, COVID-19 in China. So again, you get stiffening of the lungs. Because the lungs become stiff, as we're pushing air into the lungs, which is the opposite of what normal lung physiology is, but that's just how we have to ventilate people, you can develop something called barotrauma. So what that means is if your lungs stiffen up suddenly and we're pushing air in, the lung can actually blow. It can pop. And that is life-threatening when you're on a ventilator. You re this results in poor oxygenation, whether you have the barotrauma or not, poor oxygenation and poor ventilation. So ventilation refers to the ability to clear CO2. If you don't clear CO2, it affects your brain. It affects your brain chemistry. If you're not on a ventilator and you develop CO2 retention, you can actually pass out and die. This does not happen when you wear a mask. I know there's a lot of stuff going around out there about wearing a surgical mask and you're gonna get CO2 toxic and you're gonna pass out. I wear masks all day, every day when I'm doing procedures. If I'm, when I was doing lung transplant, I would scrub into the transplants often, even though I'm not a surgeon. I wore masks all the time. Uh, sometimes when our TV ward would shut down, the negative pressure would shut down, we'd have to wear a TV mask all day long. You don't pass out from wearing a mask. Again, patients often have uh, permanent scarring. So I, I want you to bear with me here. I know that I've sort of hammered this, but I think it's really important that people understand why doctors are trying to emphasize the need for social distancing, wearing masks, and avoiding getting COVID-19. Okay, so here's another image. This is that image that I showed you in the last slide. And I'm gonna talk you through a couple things here. So I want you to look at image C. So where the arrow is pointing, that hole is normal in the sense that that's the airway. It's a little larger than it should be, but it's nothing outside of the ordinary, um, nothing abnormal. Where the green arrow is, I'm hoping that you can see if you compare that area of the lung to the area, uh, that same area in A, you can start to see a lot of little holes. That's literally holes in the lung. That's where the lung has been destroyed. That does not grow back. So that is what has been done to this person. Remember I talked about barotrauma? I, I talked about how when patients get ARDS, they're at risk for a collapsed lung. We call that a pneumothorax. And what that requires is an emergent chest tube insertion. So we make an incision in the side and we insert a chest tube into the lung. Um, because if we don't do that, the patient is going to code uh, on positive pressure ventilation. This patient definitely had a chest tube put in for barotrauma. So at some point, this patient's lung collapsed. That's what's in that circle, that 
very, very thick white circle is not a hole in the lung. That's not the lung at all. That's a chest tube. And that's because when you look at A and B, that was earlier in the course of their disease, and then C and D was later in the course of their disease. So while I don't want to scare people, I do want people to understand how serious this disease process really is, and I want them to understand why we are saying your goal should be avoiding getting this disease. Okay, so just very quickly, um, this is the definition of how we define it. You guys can look at this on, at your own leisure, but I just want to point out where the gigantic arrow is. We categorize these as mild, moderate, severe. If you have mild disease and you have ARDS, you have a 27% mortality. Moderate is 32% and severe is 45% mortality. So this is not a, this is, disease is not a joke. We don't really know much about the epidemiology, partly because when we are looking at the incidence of uh, ARDS, we're relying on death certificate data. And a lot of times, you know, people don't die of ARDS per se, they die because they have a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest or sepsis. And so sometimes people aren't putting ARDS on the death certificate. What is clear is over at least the last 10 years, there's been a relatively stable incidence of ARDS. There was one exception to, to that. Um, mortality has gone down as we've learned better techniques, as we have found better ways of ventilating people, um, with the exception of 2009. And again, that is because of swine flu. So it is uh, completely plausible that we're gonna see a bump in mortality again this year because of COVID-19. And another thing that's very important is that there are absolutely race and gender disparities that persist to this day with ARDS. So before ARGENET, so ARGENET was the big trial that was done that showed how we should be ventilating these people to protect their lungs. So prior to ARGENET, we were not ventilating them in this way. People would drop their lungs. They would have pneumothoraces all the time. In fact, it was so common that staff would often just go, oh, he's got ARDS. Go ahead and put him on the ventilator. Let's just go ahead and put four chest tubes in him because it's only a matter of time before his lung collapses. And that's, in fact, what would happen. Now, of course, we can prevent a lot of that with the way that we ventilate people. And we've seen improvements in mortality from as high as 70% to 30 to 40%. But 30 to 40% mortality is still very high mortality. Here's what's really scary about ARDS, and I think what a lot of people aren't understanding. This isn't a situation where if you develop ARDS and you go home, everything's fine. One year mortality is actually worse than 28 day mortality. And part of that is because of something we call the one third rule. So one third of people who survive ARDS, their lungs get slightly better. They rarely, if ever, come back to completely normal. You're always gonna have some degree of scarring most likely. One third of people stay about the same, but one third of people worsen and their scarring continues to worsen. If you do survive ARDS, there's significant disability associated with it. So people with ARDS are often on the ventilator for long periods of time, whether that's due to COVID or not. When you're put on a ventilator, it weakens all of your muscles because you're not moving your muscles, right? The whole idea of use it or lose it. Um, you develop things like critical illness myopathy, critical illness neuropathy, um, you often have to go to rehab, you can develop permanent nerve damage, you can require oxygen for the rest of your life. So there is significant disability associated with surviving this. So this is not something where people should be having COVID parties, as I said earlier. So again, you guys can look through this in great detail in the future. These are just some of the causes and risk factors. We, we break these down often into direct lung injury and indirect lung injury. The reason that's important is ARDS is not something that just occurs with pneumonia or viral illnesses. If you become septic, if you have a diabetic foot ulcer that gets infected and you become septic, which is an overwhelming infection, you're at risk of ARDS. If you are in a motor vehicle accident, you are at risk for ARDS. I'm going to spend a few seconds talking about alcohol because most people do not realize that alcohol damages the lung. If you drink chronically, and moderate alcohol um, is defined for women as uh, one drink a day. So if you're, if you're somebody who's coming home and going, man, I really need that glass of red wine tonight, um, particularly now when you're sort of locked down with the kids and all of this other stuff, it does increase your risk of ARDS up to four times higher than someone who doesn't drink. Um, to excess or who doesn't binge drink or who doesn't drink a moderate or a high amount of alcohol. And again, for women, moderation is considered one drink a day, but that does increase your risk of ARDS. If you go to my Instagram account at underscore the veg doc, I show some graphics on that and I have a link to a good review article if anyone is interested. 
But these are the multitude of mechanisms by which this occurs. So the reason I happen to know this is because Emory is one of the few places in the world that has something called an alcohol lung biology center. And Emory doctors are the ones that figured out um, that alcohol is a key determinant in your risk of developing ARDS. And again, this isn't just for COVID. This is for any cause of ARDS. So what are your risk factors for a poor outcome? Well, if you're a man, you're more likely to have a poor outcome. If you're African-American or Hispanic, you are more likely to have a poor outcome. Initially, there was some data to suggest that there wasn't a poor outcome with obesity. We're now starting to see data that suggests that's not the case. What we can say for obesity is um, it makes it challenging to ventilate people who are heavier set. And the reason for that is quite simple. Remember I said that ARDS causes stiffening of the lungs. Well, part of the way that we determine that stiffening is we're looking at graphics that our ventilator is spitting out at us. So we get information from the ventilator. The problem is the ventilator can't distinguish between stiffening of the lungs, meaning inability to expand the lung because the lung itself is stiff, or a heavy chest wall that is having to be lifted. So it can be very challenging to determine how to ventilate folks who are obese. We also know that if you're older, you have a poorer outcome. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about this second phenotype, the second presentation that we're seeing. So initially, everybody was treating this like, you know, you have a pneumonia, you may or may not have ARDS, and that's how we're going to treat it. What we're now seeing is that some people who are on the ventilator seem to have actually fairly compliant lungs, meaning they seem to have fairly relaxed lungs. They don't seem to have that stiffening, but they still have profound hypoxia. They still have very, very low levels of oxygen out of proportion to what we're seeing on their lung physiology. And so what we think is happening, what we have found is happening, and this is based on a lot of autopsy data, but a lot of clinical data as well, is these folks seem to be forming blood clots on top of the infection and the pneumonia. And the clots can occur in a couple different places. So we're finding microthrombi or small clots that are forming within the blood vessels that supply the lungs themselves. That's key because that's very different than a pulmonary embolus. A pulmonary embolus is when you form a blood clot in the leg or in the arm, in the veins, it breaks off and it travels through the venous system through the right side of the heart and then blocks off um, the blood vessels that go to the lungs. That's different than when the blood clots are forming within the blood vessels themselves. Different in the sense of the pathophysiology is different. We often treat them the same. We often use blood thinners for these. So right now, the way that we're treating these folks is supplemental oxygen. We're trying to see if we can keep them off the ventilator. Sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. And then blood thinners. So there's a variety of different blood thinners we can do. So we can do things like Coumadin or no novel anticoagulants. Um, we can give people TPA, which is a clot buster that we use often for people who have ischemic strokes. The problem is there isn't enough data to suggest that it always works every time. In fact, many people who uh, many people who get these treatments initially do fine, and then they don't seem to get better even when we keep them on continuous blood thinners. If you are somebody who has aspirin at home or has blood thinners at home, do not start pounding these medications thinking that this is going to protect you from ARDS. What it is going to do is dramatically increase your risk of bleeding into your head or having a bleeding ulcer, which are also life-threatening. Unless you are in a hospital with COVID-19 and a doctor thinks that this is your phenotype and you need to be on a blood thinner, do not start taking blood thinners at home for COVID-19. If you're on a blood thinner for other reasons, don't start going, oh, well, maybe I'll just run my INR higher. Maybe I'll double up on my dose. This is not a good plan. All it does is increase risk of really bad outcomes with no evidence that there's any benefit to it. It will not prevent you from getting COVID. So again, there's, like I said, there's not enough data on blood thinners. Some studies are showing benefit. Some are initially showing benefit, but then the patients deteriorate. And again, as I said, trials are ongoing and nobody should empirically be starting blood thinners. That is, no one should just start taking blood thinners at home. So what are the treatments that we've gone through? So at one point, we were looking at antiretroviral therapy, the same kinds of drugs that we use for HIV. And the reason for that is, although the, the viruses are different in many ways, when they replicate, there is at one part a common pathway. So protease inhibitors um, could have theoretically worked because they would affect the replication pathway for COVID-19. So there was a drug called um, Kaletra, ritonavir, lapinavir, 
that we looked at because it seemed to make sense that this would work. Unfortunately, data um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that it did not work. It did not improve mortality. It didn't decrease days on the ventilator or decrease ICU days. The reason I bring this up now, even though it's kind of old information, is I'm starting to see reports that people who take PrEP, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, for HIV, think that that somehow protects them from COVID-19. It absolutely does not because PrEP is not at all, doesn't work on the same mechanism. It doesn't work on the same part of the pathway uh, that um, Kaletra does. If you take Kaletra, don't start overdosing on Kaletra. Don't start passing Kaletra out to other people. Again, the drug did not show benefit. So certain politicians have talked about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. So it's really important to understand that scientists have never felt that this was beneficial. And the reason I say that is the initial study that everyone was hanging their hats on was a study of 20 some patients who had supposedly shown benefit, except in that study, they took four people out of the analysis. Those four people they said were lost to follow up, except they weren't really lost to follow up. Three of them ended up in an ICU and one of them died. So four of them actually had worse outcomes and they were taken out of the analysis. If you take four people with bad outcomes out of an analysis to show a good outcome, I would argue that that is not a good study. And so we never felt that there was evidence that there was a benefit. We were trying it because, again, because of the mechanism of action, there seemed reasonable um, uh, there, it seemed reasonable to try it in people on an experimental basis. And, and, and let me be clear, when I say experimental, I don't mean we're experimenting on people like, you know, the horrific Tuskegee experiments and things like that. I mean in a trial situation or on what we call a compassionate basis, okay? And that's when someone is dying, it's clear that they're not going to survive, so you're sort of tr trying everything you can. But the really important thing about these drugs is when we give them to people in an ICU setting, we're monitoring their heart rhythms because they can cause fatal arrhythmias if you're taking them. So if you have this stuff at home and you're taking it, you are dramatically increasing your risk of dying at home of a fatal arrhythmia, particularly when you combine it with something like azithromycin or a Z-Pak. All of this is irrelevant because we now have multiple studies that show that it's not effective. We have got a couple studies that show that it didn't show any benefit at all. We have one decently large study that showed that it actually caused increased mortality, or we saw higher rates of mortality in people that were being treated with it, whether it's the cause or not. So nobody should be taking these drugs. These are no longer drugs that anybody should be being treated with. Remdesivir, as I said, is very promising. Um, there are really good ongoing trials on this. How do I know that they're really on good ongoing trials? I can tell you that one of the trial centers is Emory and one of my old um, residents, so when I was a fellow, I actually helped to train him, Anish Mehta. He's the, the chief of infectious diseases at Emory. He's in charge of this. I don't know a doctor who has more integrity than Anish. So this trial is in excellent hands. So what they're showing is some, some really promising data and we're seeing really good outcomes. Well, I shouldn't say really good outcomes. We're seeing modest benefit. So when, it's not like you take the remdesivir and you go from being on the ventilator to 48 hours, you're off the ventilator. But we are starting to see that it's shortening the course of the disease. So it's not a cure-all by any stretch of the imagination. None of these things have been shown to cure COVID, but it does seem to shorten the disease at least to some degree. So a lot of people talk about vitamin C. I know in New York, they were pounding people with vitamin C. That's based on studies like the Citrus ALI trial. That's C-I-T-R-I-S hyphen A-L-I. That trial was not a trial of ARDS. That was a trial of sepsis and ARDS, okay? So nobody at home should be taking massive doses of vitamin C. You can actually get vitamin C toxic from it. You know, routine amounts of vitamin C are important to take. What's really important to also understand is when you do supplements, it's not nearly as effective as just getting vitamin C from fruits and vegetables. We know that from previous studies. So yes, definitely eat foods that are high in vitamin C, but don't start pounding massive amounts. There's no evidence that it's going to help. And there is a lot of evidence that it can uh, cause toxicity. So plasma from previously infected persons, that's called convalescent plasma. Um, that seems to be uh, helping to shorten the duration. Again, it's not curing people, but it stands to reason that if someone is struggling to fight off the infection, if we can boost the amount of antibodies they get by giving them someone else's antibodies, that that would seem to help. And it is seeming to help right now. 
And again, as I said, anti-IL-6 therapies seem to be working as well. Blood thinners are, again, is another option, particularly if you have that second phenotype. Um, and then there are other immune modulators that are out there, things like interferon 2B and, and things like that that may work. We just don't have enough data at this time. So this is sort of uh, the end of part one. I'm going to go through some summary slides, um, and then um, we'll, we'll get to part two. So COVID-19, as I said, is a zoonotic virus, meaning it's a spillover virus that we are getting because it's coming from our use of animals where viruses mutate and then it spills over and is causing deadly disease in humans with high infectivity. Younger patients are absolutely not exempt from severe illness. In fact, the majority of patients who are ending up in the hospital are less than 65. And there is severe morbidity and mortality associated with this. So mortality meaning death rates, morbidity meaning disability. Isolation is the ideal way to avoid spread. However, given that A, people can't isolate or B, people won't isolate, it is important to wear a mask um, when you go out in public and to physically distance. Please do not hoard N95s. They're likely not gonna work as well for you because they've not been fitted for you. If you have N95s and you know of a hospital that's having a shortage, please give it to a hospital. Or if you know a nurse, or if you know a medical assistant, or a physician, or somebody who needs an N95. Um, now, surgical masks, uh, you know, I said please donate all surgical masks. If you have surgical masks at home, particularly if you live with someone who's elderly, it's probably reasonable to keep them. Because if you get sick and you're at home isolating, you need to protect the people that you're caring for from you. And so wearing a surgical mask makes sense. If you have a surgical mask and you're wearing that out to the grocery store, that also makes sense. Um, but please don't hoard them, I think is, is the point. Again, there are no current proven therapies. There are some very promising therapies. There are no cures quite yet, but we are seeing some drugs that seem to be showing promise in shortening the course and the severity of the disease, but we do need further trials. And again, the importance of doing all of this, the importance of social distancing, of physical isolation, of um, hand hygiene and wearing masks is all to flatten the curves. It's to keep hospitals and staff from being overwhelmed. We know from scientific data that overwhelmed staff and overwhelmed hospitals translates to poorer outcomes. So again, ARDS is a devastating disease and COVID-19 is causing very high rates of ARDS as compared to say, for example, the flu. There is a second disease pattern emerging and more data is needed along with therapeutic trials. This is the disease pattern that involves a lot of blood clotting and less of an ARDS picture. If you do survive this, many survivors are left with severe and permanent disability and changes to quality of life. So if you can, please stay home. Now, when we talk about part two, we're gonna talk about how that's often not the case, particularly for people of color, but there are some things that we can do. Um, for example, staying at home for things that aren't absolutely necessary. And that is the end of part one.